All right, let's all stand this morning as we read our text, which is going to be found in the book of Joshua. Book of Joshua. And we're going to consider this morning, starting off with verse, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I will give to you, uh, to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said to, unto Moses. For this wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites unto the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto your fathers to give to them." Let's stop there and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, again, we come before your throne with, first of all, thankful hearts for your many blessings, for your watchful care and daily provisions. Lord, we ask now that you would attend to the to this service, that you would be with the word as it would goes out, that your spirit would accompany it, convict us, draw us close to you. Lord, especially as always, I pray if there's one listening to the message this day, that you would convict in such a way that if that person is lost, they would turn to you before it's everlastingly too late. Lord, we ask you would forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're going to start uh, some series of sermons and studies through the book of Joshua. And um, in some cases, we're going to kind of zoom in very closely and carefully with the text, maybe a couple of chapters, and just kind of dissect what is taking place here. Um, other places later on in the book, we're just going to kind of take it as a sort of as groups of chapters, uh, especially considering the conquests and the dividing of the, the land um, to the different tribes. So we'll kind of bulk those together, and I think towards the last chapters, we'll probably zoom in again. Joshua is rich in familiar accounts, familiar stories that um, are, were not only pertinent during Joshua's day, but they have a, a long-term effect. Many of them are what I've come to call life prophecies or living prophecies, where there's an immediate effect of what's going on in the lives of these people, but they picture so much more, something bigger, something eternal that affects every one of us in one way or another. Even Joshua himself as a man, um, not just uh, his character and who he was and what he did, uh, but his name, Joshua which I'm not going to get into so much this morning, but it is the name Jesus. They're the same name. Um, they're not the same person, obviously, but Joshua was a, a type of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to examine the name and what it means and why it is so important. Um, but today I want to kind of focus on how Joshua got this position and even backtrack a little bit and consider Moses, his predecessor, and the one that he um, followed. First thing I notice here in these verses, before we actually look at Moses a little bit, is uh, in verse 1, it says here, after the death of Moses, so he calls him the servant of the Lord. It says, It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan. So not a whole lot of time for fooling around. I, certainly there was time for mourning. Moses was a great loss uh, to not only his family, but to the, the entire nation. Um, but it was time to move forward. Moses' time had been accomplished. He's gone. He's not coming back. It's time for Joshua to now take the reins of what Moses had started and finish leading these people into the promised land. Um, this is a great transition. It's a, it's, a, it's a transition that is ordained by God and not by the election of a man 
whom the people feel is going to be the best one for the job. In fact, the people of Israel were given no consideration. God had already planned this out. Uh, unlike our country, which, you know, we're in a time of transition right now, as we are every four years, <clears throat> with an election. Um, and regardless of what you feel about the candidates, you know, every, every American has a, an opportunity to vote, vote who they think can be the best leader of this country. And according to some people, even those that have died can vote. But we'll leave that alone for now. Um, these aren't left up to men. This position is not left up to man to decide. Um, it's up to God to decide. You know what I find interesting, just a, a kind of a quick side note in watching the different things going on with uh, the primaries and the elections and things like that. It, it's becoming more and more amusing to me watching these, um, uh, for some reason the term mortals come to, comes to my mind. For the most part, not spiritual people, not thinking spiritually in any way, but trying to figure out what to do. You know, who is going to be the best candidate? Who's going to be the best leader? Who's going to best fit what I think should be right without, for the most part, any consideration for what God thinks? And that's really where we're at in the world right now. Um, it's just mankind kind of floundering, looking for some sense of order in what's going on and refusing to look to the scriptures. So I'm thankful for those of us that still have a desire to look to the Word of God for answers as to what's going on. And as long as I've been doing this, um, it amazes me how the answers are all right here in the Scriptures for everything that we have. So in this very real case here with, um, with Joshua and Moses, certainly he felt a great sense of loss at his, uh, his mentor. Uh, it, calls, it calls Joshua the minister in the, the King James Version. I think, what does the New King James say? I thought I'd remember it, but it's a different word. Assistant? Okay. He was sort of his right-hand man. And I, I like what was brought up this morning in the Sunday school class. I think, I think Joshua was being groomed for what he was about to do. And I do think it was the case where the, him and Moses were kind of thinking almost exactly alike. Like Joshua was the apprentice, and Moses would just think, and Joshua would be right there attending to what Moses needed. They were on the same page. Um, I won't say that they had become one in soul or spirit, but they were one in the fact that they had a common purpose in leading the people of God. So as we know, or as you may or may not know, actually, Moses was not permitted to lead the people into this promised land. After 40 years of leading the people wandering through the wilderness, sort of as a shepherd leading sheep, which is going back to his training you know, even before he was called by God, um, he was not allowed to lead the people into the promised land. And that had to be, as far as Moses is concerned, somewhat of a disappointment. I would say an accepted disappointment. He understood why. I think he accepted the fact that this was not his purpose to lead the people into the promised land. But even still, as a man, as a, as a human being, it had to be a little bit of a letdown. Here, after 40 years of, of suffering in the wilderness, of waiting for that last one to die, and then now they're ready to go as part of their punishment, their judgment, for refusing the first time that God allowed one of them to go in. Uh, but Moses was not allowed to be the one. And we, I think we know why, because he disobeyed God. He sinned against God to such a degree that it, his judgment was not being able to lead the people into this promised land. Um, but there's a bigger picture to that than just uh, God's judgment upon Moses. It's a prophecy. It's a picture of something greater. Some of the great things that Moses did, of course, was he established by God the law that we call the law, the Torah, referenced many, many times throughout the scriptures, Hundreds of times, even by Jesus himself, making a reference to the law of Moses, to the prophets and the law. It's, it's all a, a prophetic example of what we are doing. For this, I want to go back as far as this introductory lesson, sermon, is to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Just back a page, actually. 
We're going to focus in on, on Moses this morning and what happened here at the end and what it pictures. In the coming weeks, we're going to look more at Joshua about his greatness, his abilities, even leading up to this point, and then from this point forward, leading the people of God. If you're familiar with the book of Joshua, um, I hope you are. If you're not, I would suggest over the next weeks, read through it several times. Get familiar with the stories. Some of them you are familiar with. Um, some of the great things about Joshua as far as his character we're going to talk about. But some of the familiar stories are with um, Rahab. Oh, I, can't, what, I, I can't even think of her name. Yeah, Rahab the harlot. That's her. I keep thinking Jezebel for some reason. But she's a completely different <laughs> woman. <laughs> but Rahab was known as a, a harlot. Um, she was a Canaanite woman. But her familiarity, her notoriety is the fact that she helped the spies that went in to once again spy out the land. Um, she aided them in accomplishing this goal, and she actually ends up being a part of the lineage of David and ultimately a part of the part of the lineage of Jesus Christ himself. So a, a wonderful picture there, uh, the scarlet thread that she uses to, to indicate to the people becomes a very sort of a prophetic past and present and future a uh, lesson about Christ, the blood of Christ, all of that, uh, the different conquests that they had, great victories, uh, the wall of Jericho coming down, um, even some great failures in Ai where sin uh, was exposed and they failed greatly against a people that they should have been able to go in against. So many lessons that we can learn personally from, but then have such a bigger a bigger picture. I'm, I'm excited to dig into this more in probably a way that I never have, really. But let's now go back to Moses, okay, because he is key to all this. He has now died um, without even being able to go into. I don't know what's worse, actually, if I was Moses. Uh, if God had not even allowed him to get a glimpse or see what they were going to inherit um, and then dying without seeing it or seeing it, imagining what it's going to be like going in there and then not being allowed to. Some prophecies there, prophetic uh, pictures we're going to consider. But let's start here in verse 30, chapter 34, verse 1. I do want to read through this, and then we'll come back through and um, uh, dissect a little bit some of the thoughts that are presented here. But at the end of Moses' life, it says in verse 1, Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, that is, over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and to Naphtali, and to the land of Ephraim, and to Manasseh, and to the land of Judah, unto the utmost sea. I believe they were called those things at that time. This is written afterwards, obviously. In fact, this last uh, part of the book of Deuteronomy, the last part of this Torah, clearly wasn't written by Moses himself. Um, there is speculation on whether Joshua is the one who finished writing this. Some actually think it may even go further into history with Samuel or one of the other prophets kind of finishing the, uh, the accounts here. But nonetheless, let's, uh, verse 3. And to the south of the plain and the valley of Jericho, to the city and the plain of Zoar, the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham unto Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over there. So this is all prophesied. They knew this. Moses knew this. They all knew how significant the promise that God made to Abraham was. And now this is the, I'm going to say a partial coming to fruition of what God had promised. It's not the final stage. This is all the physical part of it. The final stage is going to be for all of this when the Lord himself returns, who is the seed of Abraham. And he is the one who will conquer and gain control over all of this world. One of the things I want us to think about is the prophetic picture that Moses is allowed to see here. Okay, A lot of it's desert. A lot of it is uh, cities that have been built up by by people who thought this was their land. 
They thought that they obtained it by victorious wars and overcoming other people, and they established their roots, they planted their flag. But it's not their land. It's God's land. And God was going to take what rightly belongs to him. In a big picture, this pictures a couple of things. Um, on the one hand, I think in reality, it pictures this entire world belonging to the Lord and how different tribes of people have established their claims in the world. Um, they planted their flags. We're so proud of our, our United States, and in some ways rightly so. It's been a great blessing for the people of God. But this isn't our eternal, our eternal home. Um, if I was to be able to pick and choose, trusting that I'm going to be part of that, that big picture when the Lord returns, I don't know where I'd want to live. I, I don't necessarily think it's Southern California. I appreciate it now. I like it here. I have no plans on moving anywhere. But in, in eternity, I don't know, maybe Hawaii, maybe some other place uh, might be better. Who knows? But my point is, though, that this world does not belong to any person. We, we've got some big shots right now in the world, Putin, others that are trying to gain a bigger control of a portion of the world and ultimately be that world dictator. Well, they're not that world dictator. However, the one who is, Satan, he's working through these puppets, trying to establish his kingdom through men. And it's all, it's all futile. It's temporary. The Lord is going to gain control of this world in a, in a powerful battle that no man can stand against. Okay, so that's kind of a big picture as far as that's concerned. We might even think of this, this what Moses has the ability to see in a more simple way of being, we'll call it heaven. Okay, not necessarily the kingdom of God, although I, I, I do in my heart think that really what he's seeing is the kingdom of God, but we'll, we'll call it heaven, okay? But understanding that Moses, the fact that he did not get to go in does not mean that he's lost, okay? That he's not saved, that his judgment is hell. In fact, I'll even go so far as to say this. I think all of those, those people that died in that judgment in the wilderness, not being able to go in, to this promised land, I don't think that it's picturing them going to hell. I don't think that's the case at all, okay? I think the picture is they were delivered, saved, when they were in Egypt, but their faith wavered when it came time to really show their faith in following God. So there, there's so much here that we're going to expound upon over the coming weeks. But let's move on. <clears throat> in verse 5, says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. Oh, clearly, he didn't write this. Uh, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Uh, they buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, but <coughs> no man knows of his sepulcher or tomb, his grave, unto this day. This was written many, many years later, so for quite some time, nobody really knew of what happened to Moses, the body of Moses, kind of a mystery, actually, in some ways. There's a very interesting verse in Jude, I think it is, uh, that talks about <coughs> Michael, the archangel, and Lucifer, Satan, battling over the body of Moses, fighting over it. I don't know what that means, to be honest. I've thought about that often. But his death, his burial, uh, it was, seemed to be a private Burial, the fact that it says no man knows where his tomb was, almost indicates to me that it was something supernatural, that God was the one that took care of the body of Moses, and nobody knows where it was, but nonetheless, he did die. In verse 7, it says Moses was 120 years old when he died. Uh, his eyes were not dim, nor his natural force abated. There's a, a lot of discussion now over our two main presidential candidates who are both in their 80s, right? They're both in their 80s, I think, or Trump is close to being 80, but they're both old, <laughs> and 
their, their minds aren't really that sharp. Um, and they are waning in their their life force, <laughs> isn't what it once was. And I'm, I'm picking on them because they're the obvious, easy targets. But we all feel that age. You know, we feel age creeping up on us where our our life force just kind of, I'll put it this way, the body does not do what the mind wants it to do all the time. And we, we, we joke when, you know, one of those candidates takes a tumble and falls. It's, it's humorous to watch on the one hand, but then... On the other hand, don't you feel bad? I, <laughs> on the one hand, I almost think it's cruel for their families to allow them to be both putting through, through all this. But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> Moses was not like that. He, his life vigor was still in him. His, his eyes were clear. His perception, his mind was sharp. But it was time for him to go. It was time for him to die. He lived... 120 years, as we've talked about, broken into three equal segments of 40-year periods. The first 40 years as a leader of Egypt, second 40 years as a shepherd in the wilderness, the last 40 years as a shepherd of God's people in the same wilderness. And at one time, he was a, a mighty deliverer of this people out of the land of Egypt, um, Moses, his, his greatest victory, I think, his greatest notoriety is the fact he is the one that gave the law to the people of God. It's associated with his name. We think of the law. We think of the law of Moses. We think it's almost like the two go hand in hand. And that's really the way the, 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 the scriptures present this. So th- there's actually a sort of a, a life prophetic picture even in that itself. That Moses, who pictures the law, who gave the law, I'm going to talk a little bit about the law this morning, the law, Moses, could not take them into that promised land, could not get them into heaven, could not get them into that kingdom of God. It took something else to get them from that point, from wandering in the wilderness, wandering through life, if you will, into that next stage, okay? Understanding this is a very real account. These people are living it out. I don't know how much of an understanding they had as we do. We have the completed word of God. We, we have almost all of the pieces of the puzzle in place. So we can or should be able to see it clearly, whereas they were, I like the way Paul put it, looking through a mirror dimly. Okay, It was, it was there, but it was kind of foggy don't really understand it. But we get this understanding that Moses, who pictures the law, was not able to get them in there. It took something else. To give you a little bit of a a foresight or um, future lesson understanding, Joshua brought them in. Jesus brought them in. The Bible says there's no other name given among men by where we are saved in the name of Jesus Christ. I think I butchered that. But the law, which basically pictures righteous works, good works, even works that were given by God, cannot get people over that hump into the blessings of God. It doesn't work that way. These works are good. They were necessary. They are still necessary in many cases. But these good works that are described in the scriptures are not what saves us. It didn't even save Moses himself, who's the one that got them from God, gave them to the people. It did not allow him to get into, physically, this promised land. Now, I have, there's no, not a doubt in my mind, every ounce of my being believes that Moses is going to be right there in the kingdom of God, somewhere in a very high place, right next to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the rest, even Adam, probably some we wouldn't think are going to be there, but Moses will be there. But in this prophecy of his life, in what he's picturing, not only in his writing, but in his being, was not able to go into this land that pictures something really great. Let me finish this account, then we're going to go into some uh, other New Testament passages. So we saw where his... Um, his eyes did not dim, his natural force, as uh, King James says, did not 
diminish. Verse 8 says, The children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So there was a time, actually a time of mourning that goes beyond the prescribed time. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. I guess a couple of obvious things to think about are, it, it's sad when somebody dies, for sure. Okay, No matter how much of a servant of God they are, how well that they're loved, every, every one of us is going to one day die. We rejoice in those that have lived a life that is pleasing to the Lord, that when they die, they know where they're going, they, they live their life confidently serving God. Um, that was Moses. And when they die, it's a, it's a loss in this world, but it's a victory on another hand. They, this, this world and everything about it is temporary. Um, most of us are not going to live even to be 120 years old. Uh, you know, 90 now, 100. We know this life is short. But those that have faith in this word, in the God of this word, in Jesus Christ, have a confidence that goes beyond this flesh. We know where we stand with the Lord. We should know. One of the the greatest things about the Word of God is it gives anybody that understanding of where they stand with the Lord. Initially, what it does is it exposes us in our sin. And nobody that is born in this flesh, when they die, is, is going to be anywhere close to this promised land or even anywhere close to heaven. Their destiny is hell without the Lord. That's what the Bible reveals. And somebody who is lost, right before they come to a knowledge of of Christ as their Savior, they know without question that they are undone without him. Okay? I'm going to address that more, but I wanted to point this out, that when Moses died, it was a great loss. But there came a time where the people had to move on. It was time for them to continue what he had started, and now Joshua was going to be that one. So verse 9 now says, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded. So he was, in essence, ordained by Moses, to continue what he had started. It wasn't Moses' choice. This was by God. We're going to consider how God was involved in this, even going back prior to a lot of this with Joshua. But in verse 10 it says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants, and to all his land. And all that mighty hand, in uh, in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Closes out Moses, at least in the Torah, uh, what a great man he was, and what God did through him. But he did not get to go into the promised land. There's, there's a beautiful picture here, as I've been insinuating, and I want to talk a little bit about now, how Moses represents the law. He represents basically the word of God. The, the word of God is full of instructions for us on how to live our life, how to do the right thing, what sin is, what righteousness is. But the point of the law, of the word of God is, is not to be an instrument for us to get into heaven. The only way we can get into heaven is by grace through faith, without the works of the law. The law is for those who are already bound for heaven with instruction for them how to live this life so that they can be a candidate for the coming kingdom of God. That's why we're here. That's why we're members of the Lord's church. That's why we require faith before baptism. That's why we require faithful church membership because our goal as a people is to continue doing what was established by those that came before us and hopefully pass the torch on to others who will continue to do the same thing. We're all going to die. Every one of us is going to die. But what the Bible gives us is this 
this understanding of how to approach that impending death properly, in the right way. So many go through life without even a consideration of what comes after death. So I'm going to go to some verses. I I think the best book in the New Testament, if I was to uh, categorize them, would be the book of Romans, because it really, the whole book is addressed to this idea in mind. So uh, since we don't have the time this morning to go through the entire book, we're going to choose out some verses to consider. So the law itself, what Moses represents, and what it does is it exposes the weakness and limitations of the flesh. Okay? Romans chapter 3. Now I'm going to do something a little bit odd here, I think. But I want to read verses 19 through 23. And then go back to the first part of the chapter. But let's start with this. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Paul writes this. He says, Now we know that what the things soever the law says, it says unto them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And listen to this. All the world may become guilty before God. This is the purpose of the law. The spoken word of the law, the written word of the law, and the living word of the law, which is Jesus Christ. All of it is intended to expose man for being dead in trespasses and sins. And that's what it does. So oftentimes when people want to feel righteous or better about themselves... It's almost natural, I think, for us to compare ourselves for those that are less than us, okay? Less righteous than us. Those that are bigger sinners than we are. Um, And the fact is, the only one that we can compare ourselves to and the only one the Bible compares us to is Jesus Christ. And the best person in the world, Paul, who wrote this, he was pretty high-minded about himself, pretty self-righteous. He was one of those Pharisees, or being trained to be a Pharisee, who were known for being self-righteous. They they puffed up their chest. They walked around like they were high and mighty. They looked down on other people. They considered themselves to be the standard of righteousness based on their own righteousness. Paul, if you know his story, he had to be brought down. And the way he was brought down was by meeting Jesus Christ. Who, who, who was the one that he was trying to kill because Jesus, in the word of Christ, exposed everybody for the sinners that they were, even Paul. So he came to this conclusion. He writes this many years after he had been saved. He was baptized as a great apostle. But he writes here that the law, the purpose of the law, is that all the world may become guilty before God, which is why we preach the word of God. You and I can't convince people that they're lost, but the word of God can. In verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is, by faith of Jesus Christ. I'm pretty sure the New King James Version says by faith in Jesus Christ. The proper translation is not by our, it's not our faith in him, really. It's the faith of Christ. He was the one that overcame the flesh. He was the one that was never charged with sin. He's the one that was tempted in all points as we are, yet never sinned. So it was his faith, and and make no mistake about it, he was faithful and obedient while he was in this flesh. Did he have the option to sin? I think he did. It was presented to him. Did he have the ability to sin? Boy, I've gone back and forth in my mind about that, but he was God, God in the flesh. 
Um, he didn't sin, is the point. He overcame the flesh. He lived a righteous life that no man was able to do, but he did it. So it's it's of him that we accomplished it, not so much our faith in him. Not that we don't put our faith in him, though. That's not That's not my point. But it was his faith initially that accomplished all of this on our behalf. So where Moses failed and was not able to go in because of his unbelief, Jesus is the one who in every way was obedient to the word of God. There's some great meditative stuff in there if you want to take the time to think about it. But in any case, by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. And there is no difference. Why? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, everybody is condemned to hell because of Adam's sin. We can't blame Adam. We're all guilty as charged. Therefore, we are all lost and condemned. Now, just for a moment, let's go back to the first part of this chapter. In verse 1, Paul writes here, What advantage then has the Jew or what profit is there in circumcision? Being a Jew was important. Circumcision was important. He says much in every way. Chiefly or foremost because unto them were committed the oracles of God. The law was given to them. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and that mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. Then how shall God judge the world? In other words, God is righteous. He is the only one that righteous. He doesn't answer to anybody. He is the one who made the law, who is the law, who gave the law to Moses. Moses distributed the law, and now man has the law. But one thing he goes into on this is, well, what if a person never heard the law? What if somebody never even was exposed to man's religion, as we say? Are they still accountable? The answer is yes. And that's explained in previous chapters, how all of us, no matter who we are, where we came from, what our lot is in life, what our background is, what nationality we are, how rich we are, how poor we are, none of that makes any difference. Every one of us has one thing in common. No matter what we look like or who we are, we all have one thing in common. We are the seed of Adam, and that's it. We are born in sin. It's not what we've done that makes us sinners. It's who we are that makes us sinners. I had a saying I used to say a lot years ago. I haven't said it lately. It's not my original thought, but I adopted it. Um, It goes like this. I think this is it. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Think about that. It's not what you've done that made you wrong with God. You are born in the state of sin. I'm not going to take the time to talk about innocent children when they die, babies. That, that to me, is a futile argument. It's, um, it's pointless. Any logical person who understands the word of God, understands God, understands judgment, knows that a baby is not accountable for the things that they do. But nonetheless, they're, they're sinners. They don't know. They don't understand Uh, The same thing could be said about a person who is an adult who has uh, limited mental capacity, okay, who who doesn't have the capability of understanding right and wrong. Um, I think they're going to be judged in much the same way. But that doesn't describe most of humanity. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it doesn't describe any of you. (laughs) That's how highly I think of you. (laughs) I think you have great mental capacity. I think you have the ability to understand. I think you know, okay? What I don't know, um, well, I know for most of you, I know your testimony, I've heard your testimony, I've heard your 
your testimony of repentance and salvation. So I, and that I do know. But many people that I meet, I don't know. I can't know. I'm not God. God knows. And you know. And God will reveal to all. Let's go to chapter 5 in Romans. Verses 1 and 2 and then verse 12. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I talk a lot about, or I have been, about verses that are worth meditating on. Think about that verse and what it says. Being justified by faith, we have peace. Do you have peace with God? If I was to ask this question, it's kind of, I hesitate to ask it, but I think it could prove to be true at some time, so at some points. If you were called upon right now to stand before God, how much peace do you have in your heart that all is well? I can only answer that for myself. I don't, I don't know anybody else's heart. Peace is one of those things that is internal. Sometimes people try to find peace by doing good works, by helping the old lady across the street, opening doors for people, thinking, okay, I've, I've done my good deed for today. That's, that's, that's good. I mean, yeah, it's good to help old ladies across the street. It's good to hold the door from people, do, good to do good works. But at the end of the day, you still have that tomorrow. What good are you going to do tomorrow to have that same peaceful feeling? These things are fleeting. The only real peace comes from the peace that Christ gives us in understanding where we stand with God. And that's what the word of God gives us. So therefore, we do have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, for time's sake, I want to jump down to verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. There's been some pretty wicked people in the world, Pretty wicked men, pretty wicked women, whose it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that person is bad to the core. Other people hide it a little bit better. <laughs> We're all bad to the core. We're all rotten inside. Some people disguise it better than others. But we're all sinners. We all need saving. Can God save the the worst possible sinner in the world? Some people think that they're beyond salvation. The Bible doesn't say that. Paul himself, who calls himself the chiefest of sinners. Why? Because he persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a murderer. And yet, God saved him. Um, and if you think about that story, that account in the book of Acts, the early church was skeptical, of course. Not only was he a, a murderer, but he was a liar. Okay? He would do anything to get in among God's people to do damage. So they were very skeptical. And God had to really show that Paul had been changed, but he was changed. Back when um, Osama bin Laden, remember him? He was such a terror in the world, a threat. He did a lot of damage. He's, he's the one that really seems to have been the mastermind behind the Twin Towers and over 3,000 people dying within a couple of hour period. And then more than that. So he was kind of on the uh, world's most wanted list for a long time. And I, was th I remember exactly where I was when the, on the news uh, it was announced that he had been killed. And I, I rejoiced. I thought, wow, that's, that's great. But then the other part of me said, wow, right now he is standing before the Lord giving an account of the things that he has done. Was he any different than Paul? 
Osama bin Laden was a mass murderer. He hated he hated Christians, but he associated Christianity with Americans, and the two don't go hand in hand, of course, but he was a very hateful man. I believe the Lord would have saved him, given opportunity. Um, I, I have to believe that at some point he had opportunity. I don't know how that works out. But my point is this. He's an obvious one. Others of us learn to disguise our sin, our hatred, maybe even our murder. Jesus said that murder in the heart is on a higher level than murder of someone's life. What the Bible does is it exposes us for who we really are in the core of our being. It speaks to our soul in a way that no other can. All have sinned. All have sinned. In chapter 6, again, skipping many verses that are vital and important, but to this one point in verse 23. You're gonna, as you probably know what I'm going to do here. I'm going to read the first part of this verse. In English, there's seven words there. I don't know how many are in Spanish. But the first seven words of verse 23 say this, for the wages of sin is death. The word wage means a reward, what you've earned. Every one of us has earned death, which means upon death, we are going to stand in judgment before God. And thank God for the buts that are in the Bible. This is one of those buts that is Life-changing for everybody who believes. So for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Joshua, our Lord. The wages of sin is death. What every person has earned is separation from God and judgment. The gift, not a reward. Salvation is not a reward. The fact that we're going to heaven is not something you've earned in any way. Yet people try to keep the law thinking that they're going to earn their way into heaven. Moses represents that that does not work. He died seeing it, but not being able to enter. A lot of people understand that there's a heaven, there's a hell. They see heaven. They want to enter. They think they've been good enough To enter. But when it comes right down to it, like Moses was not able to enter, they cannot enter. They will be rejected because they've never trusted in Christ as their Savior. They've never had the blood of Yeshua, Jesus, applied to them, which is what all of that represents. In in, in a story, there is so much that has eternal value. It's not by works. It's not by baptism. It's not by faithful church attendance, not by doing good. It's not by circumcision. It's not by anything that's done in the flesh. It's only by faith in Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life. When those people, just as a temporary life story, when Joshua did lead them into that promised land, it wasn't eternal. Every one of those people still died. But when we enter into heaven, the kingdom of God, It is eternal. That is what we're looking forward to. Last passage, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. If I may, verses 1 through 13. Verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Well, they had the law. Why weren't they saved? Because many didn't believe. You know what had happened over the years? Probably culminating up to when the time of Christ, is that the people of Israel, the faith that was given to them had become just merely religion. Going through the motions, it was all fluff, no depth, 
the Pharisees, the leaders of God's people. It was all superficial. It was empty. But that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. So Paul now, coming to this conclusion, like Nicodemus, that there's deeper meaning here. He's missing something. He put his faith in Christ. His desire now is that all of Israel may be saved, not only spiritually, but physically. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So many people go through their religious life zealous, excited, but they don't have knowledge. It's all emotion. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. You see the key to all this? The key to all of it is faith, believing, and that includes repentance, turning from our sin, from ourself, to Christ, Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, the one who is only the only one who's going to lead us in to that land. It's all a, a, a picture of eternal things. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law. For the man that does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say, say not to thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh even in thy mouth, thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It frustrates me sometimes when I see preachers bring people to this place of somewhat of an emotional response and ask them, do you want to receive Christ as your Savior? And people will say yes. Raise your hand and repeat after me. Say this prayer and you will be saved. That's not according to the Scripture. There is no prayer given that we can be saved by. The prayer comes from a heart that understands that it's lost, that it needs Christ, and it turns to God. And sometimes you don't know what to say, but you turn to Christ. You trust in him. You believe. There are no words necessarily. It's all about faith. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek or any other nationality or any other people. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And then finally, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We don't look... I'm not looking forward to being saved. Well, let me qualify that. I'm looking forward to the deliverance of this flesh from this world, the resurrection, the rapture, as some say. It's fine. But I know I've been saved. I'm just now trying to work out my life until the Lord returns, being used best I can by him so that I could be an effective witness of him. Otherwise, I have no purpose for being here. My reason for being here isn't to make as much money as I can or uh, whatever else this life has to offer. My only purpose here is to be a testimony for him. Why? So that others can believe in him. Why else am I here? Yeah, I love my grandkids. I love my kids. I love my wife. I love all of you. But honestly, given the choice, I'd rather be with Jesus. So I have to believe that there's a reason why I'm still here. And there's a reason why you're still here. If you're not saved, if you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, the only reason you're still alive at this point is so that you can trust in Him. There is no other reason. God's given you time. If your life has somehow gotten out of sorts, you have time to respond in repentance to Him. 
This word exposes us for who we are and what our needs are. I'm going to conclude with that. We're going to stand at this time and have a song of invitation.